And our job as advocates, parents, and even educators is to expose our students who have a need to different ways of solving that and finding out what works best for them. So it really isn't about saying, oh, well, this is what we use because this is all we have access to or what my school has. I'm Nicole Holcomb, attorney by day and podcaster by night, a former educator, school counselor, and administrator, and mom to a nine-year-old daughter with dyslexia who loves all things Harry Potter, Minecraft, and science. A few years ago, she was identified with dyslexia and our life seemed to turn upside down for a while, quite literally. I created the Dyslexia Mom Life podcast to help you navigate the upside down journey of dyslexia. You got this. If you're wanting to thrive as a mom in this dyslexia journey, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Today on the show, I'm going to be talking with Rachel Berger. She is a dyslexia and learning disabilities community consultant for Microsoft. And she's the founder and executive director of Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota. Rachel is no stranger to dyslexia. She's also a mom raising a son with dyslexia. So she's invested. She's invested in helping families and children navigate the world of dyslexia. And for many of you who may be learning from home this year, These resources are going to help you tremendously, not only in teaching from home, but also for families that just need extra help with homework. What are some tools and technology resources that will help your child at home when they're struggling to read and they're struggling to write? You are really going to love the tools that she shares with us today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Rachel. I'm so glad to have you with us today, and we appreciate you taking time to be on the show today. Um, If you could just spend a couple minutes introducing yourself and the work that you're doing at Microsoft with dyslexia, we'd love to hear more about it. Thanks, Nicole. Glad to be with you guys today. So I'm Rachel Berger. I am wearer of many hats, as many of us are. And so firstly, I'm the founder and executive director of Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota. And we are a Minneapolis-based nonprofit organization that works um, in in conjunction with um, other states in this movement. And we are a group of parent advocates who desire to change how schools are identifying and supporting students with dyslexia and also what they're providing to their educators in the way of dyslexia. And so in Minnesota, we've worked with policymakers to pass five bills in six years time to benefit students with dyslexia and their educators. And we also provide advocacy workshops to parents and support students as well. And so that's a little bit with that hat. And then in addition to that, I work for Microsoft in the field of assistive technology, specifically for students with dyslexia and learning disabilities. And then as if that wasn't enough, I'm also the mother of three sons, two of which have their share of learning differences. So we are in deep in learning differently in my household, and especially because I too am an individual who learns differently. So that's just a little bit about me. Wonderful. Well, again, I'm so excited to have you with us today. It sounds like you've got lots to share, so I'm so excited about that. Can we start at, you mentioned a few minutes ago, mother of two, which, you know, that's in and of itself a full-time job, right? (laughs) But I know that you're also- Especially when you're navigating, right? (laughs) Because it looks so different than this time last year, right? (laughs) So do you mind sharing a little bit about your family's personal dyslexia journey? Not at all. Happy to share. So um, my journey with dyslexia began when my son, who's currently 14 years old and a rising freshman starting day one of distance learning um, in the other room. So he was four and a half and ending his preschool years. And I had been concerned deeply that um, with a highly accredited, intense preschool experience that he'd had, he's coming out of preschool not able to identify his name when written Mm -hmm. and not able to write it himself and also only knew five letters of the alphabet. And so something kind of cued in there 
And as an individual who myself struggled with learning, but also watched my brothers struggle to a much deeper level with their learning, eventually causing them to drop out, I was, alarm bells were ringing. And so I sought out to understand what was going on because I was very, you know, intent on giving him a bridge to cross, not a mountain to climb as he entered his K-12 experience. And so not too many people have their child diagnosed at age five. And I did get a little bit of heat from that from you know, family members and neighbors and people who, who insisted he was just a boy and I was picking on him. And I'm glad I listened to my gut because what we found out at age five was that he was dyslexic, dysgraphic, had dyscalculia, and also had some auditory processing disorders. Um, and so the thing for me on that journey was if I look back then and, um, just being a new parent who, you know, I hadn't found my community or my voice and wasn't ready to be an advocate yet. I, I thought that that diagnosis was the golden key. And I was carrying that to the school, giving them the key to unlocking my son. And while we have many educators and, um, you know, a school system that really wants to support children, that golden key moment couldn't have been further from the truth. I would, um, that experience for me navigating initially for my son was what out of necessity caused me to start decoding dyslexia Minnesota and say, listen, if we can't say dyslexia in our classrooms, in our schools on an IEP, I'm going to change law and make sure that we can. And so that's a little bit about that journey. Um, and now we're 10 years down the road with that and things are very different. Not perfect, but very different. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing too, just you know the evolution of the things you were able to do and to recognize and to to jump in and um, you know, make sure that cha- things change for the better. And we know that's a slow, a slow change. I'm in Georgia, and so we've just, you know, a year or two ago started making some of those changes as yeah. well. It's, you know, it's it's a slow process, unfortunately, but it is it's such such needed work, though. So today, what we what we're going to dive into, and thank you again for sharing your your journey, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Mm-hmm. Is you know, as we we see the world looks different right now, right? This is nothing what we thought it would look like a year ago, right now, as far as you know, still being in the middle of a pandemic. And everybody's school looks a little different. For example, my daughter is actually in a very small school. She's in an immersion school, so all the children are dyslexic. and It's small, so they're able to go face-to-face. But my husband's school, he's a teacher. They are hybrid virtual. So kids are that Monday, Tuesday, they're at school. Wednesday, no one is. It's all virtual. And then Thursday, Friday, they flip. The kids that were at school are now home, and the kids that were home are now at school, and so there's a lot of balancing, and so I'm I'm sure that y'all are also (laughs) going through the struggles of what it looks like, and so I thought, what a better time to talk about technology and and techniques and tips Mm -hmm. that can help families and help students and help educators. I know we're going to dive into that. So let's start and talk a little bit about, and I know, you know, I'm recognizing for the audience that I'm a very visual learner. So we're going to work through this and provide some links in the show notes of all these great resources. But as we think about our students being at home or even maybe supporting their education, if they're not at home, if they're face-to-face, what are some tech, you know, technology tips or some technology resources uh, for our students? What do you recommend? Yeah, um, well, thanks for asking about that. You do know that you're going to get a very biased opinion in asking that question. So I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to tell our, our members what, what I would recommend personally. And, and that's, that's the way we're going to do here, because if, if I'm not being honest with you, I'm not, I'm not necessarily helping. So um, first of all, I want to say that technology, assistive technology in particular, when your student is ready for it, literally 
levels the playing field. It is an absolute game changer. It takes a place of weakness and a place of I can't and I'm left out and I'm left behind. And it turns that into a strength. It turns that into being able to access the curriculum and be part of your learning environment in a way that maybe you never were before. And it also enables our students to personalize that learning experience in a way that works best for them. And so when I think about these things, you know, again, we we need reading instruction to happen, right? And we need our students who are dysgraphic to understand how to write and spell and construction sentences and, and create, um, you know, a story. So we need those things to happen. But at the same rate, we also, when providing them with assistive tech, can completely change the way they are able to do that. And it's so impactful. And just a little side note about that. The reason I feel so strongly about the technology that I'm going to recommend is is because I truly believe with all of my heart that accessibility shouldn't be something that you have to ask for. It should just be there. And our lessons and things that we're doing should be designed from go, including and inclusive of everyone and every learning need out there, whether it's blind and low vision, deaf and hard of hearing, um, whether we've got executive function and focus issues, or whether we're dyslexic. We need to design and be inclusive from go, because then we can utilize the variety of technologies that are afforded to us. And the other piece is that accessibility shouldn't be a members only club for those that can pay for different apps and technologies. It should just be there. And that's why I like the tools that are represented at Microsoft. So let's get into what are some things that really, really work. Firstly, um, in addition to ensuring that your student is receiving lessons in literacy that will make them a proficient reader, you have the ability to use assistive technology for speech to text. And so there are a variety of different things out there. Like you can pay for different things like um, Bookshare or Learning Ally, and you could use that if that's the preference of the student. And I want to say a bit about that. We need to understand, we need our job as advocates, parents, and even educators is to expose our students who have a need to different ways of solving that and finding out what works best for them. So it really isn't about saying, oh, well, this is what we use because this is all we have access to or what my school has Your role is bigger than that. Your role is to ensure that they have a variety of choices in that text. So like speech to text again, like I said, there's Learning Ally, there's Bookshare. There's also Microsoft's Immersive Reader, which is built in. It's free. It's accessible with any type of device, and you can use it in a variety of places. So it's not just using it for Word documents. You can use it in Edge Browser, in an internet search, and most people don't know that. And so there's a variety of ways to access that immersive reader, and not just on your desktop device either. You can use it on your iPhone or Android or iPad. And so we're going to have a multitude of resources for you that you can check these out. And probably uh, if if uh, Nicole is game for it, I'll even include one of my webinars where I walk through all of these things and you guys can have that as a resource as well. And so again, text-to-speech, there are a variety of different options, but I really prefer Microsoft's Immersive Reader because of the multitude of uses you have and various places you can access it. The other things that are really useful for students who struggle with dyslexia or dysgraphia are dictation and editing software or writing software. And again, here, um, when I'm suggesting these things, I'm suggesting them because I have personal experience with them as an individual myself. I've experienced utilizing them in removing barriers for my sons and with students I do advocacy work for. So there's a little bit of reason why I'm I'm suggesting them in particular. So Word has the dictation software and editing and writing software to support students with dyslexia and dysgraphia. 
And in one of the resources we'll provide you, which is one of my webinars, you'll see how utilizing that software that's again, free and built in and accessible to any child takes a significant weakness of my son's and turns it into a strength. He had to, you know, language arts, you're in middle school. It's common to be asked to write a story, but if you're someone who's struggling deeply with dysgraphia, that's a really arduous task. And so an area of significant weakness was then turned into a strength because we provided my son the tools that just removed that barrier. And it was amazing. You know, his teacher literally said to me, whatever you got, I want it. I want that for everyone, you know? So those are two of the top things that I think about for our students. And then if I was to recommend one more, and this comes from my struggles with learning as an individual, uh, OneNote in Microsoft has math tools that are built in. And what I really, really love about the math tools, and again, you guys can check out one of my webinars and walk through all of these tools. But what I really love about the math tools built into OneNote is that they help individuals who struggle with things like, I struggled deeply with algebra. I didn't understand the sequence or the order of operations to solving. Like that was something that I was never, as an individual with dyscalculia, was never gonna remember. And so you can click on the math tool and it will walk you through the steps. It'll solve it like a calculator if you want. But what was more important to me was to understand, like, what's the order of operations here? And so there are tools that built in, again, that solve or help support students with math. And so, again, I just kind of look at some of these things. And I don't know about you, Nicole, but I think about, you know, having dyslexia today doesn't necessarily have to be a curse in the way that it was when I was navigating school without um, identification or support. And so our students today really have a lot more in terms of resource. Right. And schools are so much more open now to technology as well. So that helps support that, I think, as well. Right. So those are some of the tech assistive tech pieces. But I also have some resources that I like to call out for both parents and educators, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. All right. So if you're a parent, what I'd like to, to recommend to you from one parent to another is to um, look up how to support or learn about assistive technology that will support your child. And I know when you're navigating dyslexia with your children, adding one more thing, especially right now during our hybrid and distant learning, just it's it's overwhelming. I understand that. I truly do. But I will say that a lot of these technology videos that are out there are meant to be really short and easy. And there is a tremendous sigh of relief when you learn how to remove that barrier and then see your child kind of fly with it. So I would recommend to you checking out YouTube videos specifically, youtube.com backslash Mike Tholfson. T-H-O-L-F-S-E-N. And we'll include this in our resources because there are a great number of how-to videos with the types of assistive technology I'm recommending. I would also recommend to you something that we call the MEC. So it's the Microsoft Educator Community. This is where there are um, how-to videos and learnings, professional development that anyone can take, whether you're a parent or an interested individual or um, educator. So there are a multitude of, of learning videos there and they're self-paced. You can do them from your own home. And then I would also connect with your local Microsoft store, which everything has gone online now. And so if you connect with your local store and just find out what kind of virtual workshops they're offering, and then they also have individuals at those stores called a community development specialist or a education expert. And so parents and educators can reach out to these individuals to find out again, how do I learn more about this technology? Or can you help me navigate um, you know, utilizing the technology? Maybe something's not entirely going correct for you. So there's a lot of different resources there for parents. And educators, again, the Microsoft Educator Community, there are dyslexia awareness videos. 
that were created in partnership with Made by Dyslexia, which is a global charity led by Kate Griggs. And so those are available to both parents and educators on the Microsoft Educator community to take from the comfort of their own home. There are, again, in the Microsoft Educator community, a multitude of professional developments on using assistive technology. And then the last thing that I would recommend to our educators is to find ways that we can create non-stigmatizing environments for students. In particular, right now, we're distance learning, so it's a great time for students to try out different things like dictation or editor or the read aloud features um, built in or immersive reader. But when we go back to the classroom, let's keep that in mind that creating a non-stigmatizing environment opens doors and helps your students who learn differently to connect with the community and engage in their learning environment and it helps all students. And so just finding ways to, again, make, okay, students, let's, let's all try a writing assignment with dictation, or let's all try to do our research through Microsoft's Edge browser and utilize the immersive reader to do that research. And let's compare, you know, does that work well for some students or others? So those are a couple of the recommendations that I have for you in the way of assistive technology. And I would also go on to say, please do not stress out over it. It is sometimes a difficult task to learn new things, especially via technology. But this is what my kids say. There's a YouTube for that. <laughs> so if you're struggling, there's always a YouTube video for it. Or send me a message mm -hmm. and I'm happy to help. So I have a follow-up question if I can. Absolutely. You mentioned early on when your child is ready. So how do we know when our child is ready for the assistive technology pieces? That's a really good question. I think that is a personal decision for an educator or parent, but I like to try to recommend that people expose them early on and make it a little bit fun. I was working with a parent and a student last week, and he's got a third grade daughter, and he said she gets really frustrated when he tries to introduce some of these technology pieces um, during a lesson. And I said, yeah, it's because she's probably wanting to get that lesson done. And this seems like you're putting barriers in front of her. So if you expose children to these things at a time when they don't have a lesson, in particular, um, I learned with my son not to do it at the time that he needs it. You know, like, here's my assignment. I've got to get this done by tomorrow. That's not the time to introduce something new. The time to introduce it and make it more fun is you know, on a weekend, let's try to use dictation to create a fun story. Or, hey, let's read some articles from Tween Tribune on, I don't know, any topic area of interest for a student or scholastic utilizing Edge Browser and Immersive Reader to see how does this help us with our reading, in particular what I call ear reading, and, and how does that feel to do that? So I think those are recommendations on that. But in terms of timing, it's a good idea to try these things, um, you know, in that earlier K-12. I have educators that I work with at Microsoft who integrate these tools into their classroom in the, you know, first and second grade. So they're using things like this for emerging readers, using it for sight words and all kinds of other things. And so it's, it's really between both the parent and the educator you're going to need to understand how to utilize assistive technology. And it's going to be a bigger piece of your life as you move into middle school. And so how much you use it and to the level that you expose a child to it in grade school is up to you, but you don't want them left behind once they move into middle school and the pace of learning picks up so significantly that they're, they're needing something to, to bridge that gap. Right. And, and I would say, too, I, I'm going, going to obviously provide the resources um, that you're going to provide to us, to the community, but also I would just encourage people to really watch those webinars because I did watch one recently. And when you can see it, when you can see Immersive Reader, when you can see how it works, 
it, it is just amazing, first of all, of, of what it, the world it opens up for your child. But also, like you said, with YouTube and things, we can also get more experience because we didn't grow up like our kids with all the technology. And so it's great. They will probably actually be more comfortable than we are at first. So I think to, um, just going through those webinars will help you know, be able to get a grasp on what, what, it, what does it look like before I try to introduce it to my child. So I would just tell people to, you know, to, to spend that time to really dig in and watch and see, you know, what pieces might be beneficial. And you're right. I mean, I know at our house, our daughter, as many dyslexics, is very creative and she's always wanting to write a story or, you know, I, I want to create this video or I want to, yeah. So she uses the speech to text a lot because she, she can't spell still, right? She's in fourth grade, but she just really struggles to, to get that all out. But she has all these great thoughts. And I have seen her use the speech to text and it really is just amazing because she's able to. To, to really use those tools. And if I remember right from your webinar, it even some of the pieces that are in immersive reader is, is there like a little picture that will pop up even that'll show a picture and then a definition? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my favorite part of immersive reader is called picture dictionary and you can click on a word and a photo pops up to help comprehend or create meaning. And so again, just think about how amazing that is for our dyslexic kids to be able to read content at the level in which they're you know, able to process, not, not at the level that they're proficient at, but to be able to grab that higher level content and then also have something like picture dictionary um, or all of the other personalization features that are built in there. Right. Has your daughter explored with that? A little bit. She's just starting to de do some of those pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they're incorporating some of that this year in school too. So I'm excited to see how that goes. So yeah, it's amazing. All right, let's shift gears a little bit here and talk about, and you've talked a little bit about this, but maybe just, you know, if we could expand a little bit, maybe on, and you know what, I don't think we've talked about this specifically, which is more of a general question, which is, what is the best advice you've received as a mom? Not necessarily with dyslexia. We'll get to that in a moment. But when you think about, you know, we hear lots of great things for people, but I love to ask my guests, what's the best type of, what's the best advice you received as a mom? Well, that's really interesting. The best advice I received as a parent came from one of the principals at an IEP meeting, even though, you know, it, those things are not necessarily easy to navigate ever. And this was a very particularly difficult meeting we'd had. And so the best advice I got was don't apologize for being a good mother. Wow. Because I, I would frequently, um, you know, in meetings, uh, apologize for being that advocate. And um, she said, don't apologize for being a good mom. And so I think about that um, with our with our students and, um, you know, just the task that we have laid before us to navigate our kids through education with a learning disability. And you are your child's advocate. And before they can advocate for themselves, they need someone to show them the way and to ensure that they have accessibility. And it's OK to be that person. Absolutely. Yes. I think that's some of the best advice I've heard, <laughs> which is you're exactly right. I was even thinking earlier when you said um, that, you know, you had your child evaluated or identified when, when he was five and you said, you know, you got a little flack for that, but you had to go with your, your mom gut or your gut. And I think that's so true, you know, that many times that's how it happened for us. I just was at some point said, you know, something's just not right. And so I would just encourage you know, families and parents to, you know, your child better than anyone. And so if you see some signs and you have some concerns, I figured worst case scenario, they would just say, no, this is what it is. Or yes, it is developmental, but at least I would know, right. I would know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. be able to address. Um, but no, she was dyslexic. So in first grade is when we found out. So that's another good piece of advice too, is go with your gut. Mm -hmm. I that's mean, I don't know anyone who would regret that, right? 
Right. Absolutely. So I, I can't think that I've in the years as an advocate, I've ever heard someone say they regret going with their gut. <laughs> so in fact, it's quite the opposite, right? Absolutely. Um, so as so a lot of uh, my audience or a good bit, a segment of my audience, um, you know, or, or moms just trying to figure this whole thing out. And I think you said it earlier, let me look back, navigating dyslexia with your child. And I love, love that. You know, what are some bits of advice you would give to moms as, you know, we just talked about, which I think this would apply to as far as, you know, go with your gut, don't apologize. Is there anything else that you can think of if, you know, if you think back to that first leg of the journey or that first mile and then what that looked like, you know, what is some advice you would give to moms? Absolutely. So for parents that are just starting this, you know, I can say, boy, I've been there and it is overwhelming. And I think a couple of different things come to mind. First, I would say, find a community of supports that are navigating the same space as you. Uh, And that's really, really important because you're going to want to have someone to bounce ideas off of. You're going to want resources. And there's no one that understands you like people that are going through the exact same thing. And so whether that be through, you know, your local decoding dyslexia, which has chapters in every state and all Canadian provinces, or whether it's something like the IDA, or um, there's a multitude of learning disability support groups, and most of them do have Facebook pages. And I know at night, when you're sitting there, you know, you put your kids to bed and you're thinking about that next day and you're kind of doing some of your research. It's just so easy to reach out to someone on Facebook or do some of your reading in that manner. So I would connect there. A lot of the local decoding dyslexia chapters have tremendous websites full of resource. And in particular, here in Minnesota, we do, we have built our website to be a workhorse for both educators and parents. And so you could check out ours and your your local state decoding. Um, There are other things as well that I would say, again, brand new parent that I remember, keep examples of your child's schoolwork. So as you are preparing to advocate for your child, whether your child's on a 504 or an IEP, you need to select samples of your child's schoolwork that demonstrate need because need is what drives any type of a support accommodation or service in school. And so you, I don't, I'm not trying to turn people into hoarders here. (laughs) You don't have to keep everything. Keep things that demonstrate where you are going to either show improvement or demonstrate need. And put those into an IEP binder or something of the sort, label it by the year. I use a, I used to use a three ring binder and have different tabs and we had done by the school year. These binders have gotten so big that I've now taken everything and moved it all to OneDrive and OneNote and everything's digital. So I can walk in with my laptop now instead of a bunch of boxes that look like I'm a lawyer. (laughs) So at any rate, keep stuff, track stuff. You're going to need that as you become an advocate. And then in terms of becoming an advocate and going from a place of feeling emotional, and that emotion includes sorrow, um, overwhelming, anger. Uh, When I was brand new to this, I looked at it like the, the stages of grieving personally. And I think there's like eight stages to that or something. And I remember, you know, you have to be at these different steps and you have to go through them in order to get to the next level and to come to a place of leaving all that motion behind and becoming an advocate for your child. And so I would say in preparing yourself to do that, again, it's really helpful to have that community support, but also to look at a couple of different resources that are out there. For instance, really helpful to me was Pete Wright, and that's spelled R-W-R-I-G-H-T. He's a special education lawyer, and he has some really great books. In fact, one called From Emotions to Advocacy. And some some of those things legitimately give you the tools to become the advocate and to kind of leave that emotion behind and take the next steps towards, you know, here's some actions that you can do. And, 
in addition to that, I would say significantly important to find something your child is good at or they have a particular interest in and allow them to have that area where they can focus on and excel and feel really good about themselves. And that's gonna be really important as they navigate through their educational years, maybe feeling a little bit different or feeling as if they're struggling. So those are a couple of things that come top of mind for me. Um, probably one more thing I want to ensure that you have knowledge on is, again, make sure you're aware of any of the dyslexia specific or special education laws your state has, because chances are you're in a state that's done some work in the past five to seven years that's changed how dyslexia is, is looked at implemented and served in your state. And so it would be really helpful to know what those are. I worked with an individual last week that had accepted from their case manager that we can't talk about dyslexia on an IP even though the child has a diagnosis of, of dyslexia. And well, there, there have been some significant changes on that front in the past five years. And so that's not correct. And so again, it's really useful to have knowledge on what those laws are and how to, how to use those when, when you're having a meeting. And then one more thing I wanna say, it is entirely possible to create a collaborative relationship with your school. I don't think that anything is accomplished when you go in guns a blazing, accusing, and blaming. You are going to need to form a working relationship with your educators, with your administrators, and with your school district as a whole. And so it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be a strong advocate, but we don't have to invite anger to the table. We can do that in a way where we're respectful of one another and can manage to get together without third parties that have to <laughs> hold all the emotion back. So um, those are the things that I would say to someone newly navigating. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And if you could, again, uh, just remind them where they could connect with you if you have a place online or if you're very active in certain communities. And then we'll also provide some of that in the show notes as well. Absolutely. So individuals who'd love to connect with me, you can reach me through Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota and that resource will be provided by Nicole. You can also find me and follow me on Twitter and my Twitter handles at Rachel M. Berger. And so those are just a couple of places to reach out to me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today in the middle of your first day of school <laughs> to chat with us and to provide all these amazing resources. So I just want to say thank you again for the work that you're doing. And thank you again for being willing to, to share that with us today. It's a pleasure, Nicole. I'm so glad to have joined you and even more so if I can help some of our fellow parents who are new to this experience and navigating. I'm so excited. All right. Well, Rachel, it's been delightful talking with you today. Is there any other last thoughts that you want to leave us with or any work pending that's coming up that we should know about? Absolutely, there is. Um, so October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. And at Microsoft, we've been working on a series called Dyslexia Decoded. It's a three-part series that will air on Thursdays in October, starting October 8th and run for the following three Thursdays. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. We have Dr. Sally Shaywitz, we have Emily Hanford, and we also have Kate Griggs in addition to many others as we talk about the various different areas of navigating dyslexia, uh, supporting students with dyslexia, and the future and our future workforce for dyslexics. So it's an amazing event that everybody is going to want to attend and I hope you'll all join us. That's again in October and the event is Dyslexia Decoded. Um, is there a place that they'll sign up that you can give me that I can put in the show notes or? I'll give you the link in the notes. Awesome. Okay. Well, that is a, a great way to end uh, our segment today. And so thank you again. And we look forward to 
um, tuning in in October. It sounds like a great lineup of speakers. So thank you for sharing that with us. I think it's going to be an amazing resource for parents who are new to navigating, as well as those who are looking for, okay, what's next? What's the future going to be? Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. So head on over to iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast, leave a review, and who knows, you might just hear a shout out on the next podcast. I will see you next week. Same time, same place. Go enjoy your day.